Um, okay, so it gives me really great pleasure to bring to to introduce someone who really needs no introduction. Mandy Aftel is, of course, a an iconic classic perfumer uh, writer. I'd say Mandy defines a genre, and um, it's always a thrill to talk to her. I'm really happy to talk to her in this context. So. I'm just going to start with some questions and then we're just going to let the conversation flow as it does when we talk, Mandy. Uh, but first, I want to make sure to really bring this to your practice because I know we speak a lot and I know that for you, really, it comes down to the work. It's all about the work. So talk a little bit about your work and specifically, let's begin with the beginning. How did you come to perfume? I don't even think I, I really know this story. And what was it about perfumery and working with scent that triggered uh, your, your passion? I, I had a life um, before I became a perfumer. I, I became a perfumer in, I think, like my late 30s or 40s. Or, I can't remember, but a lot, it's like 30 years ago. And um, I was a psychologist for artists and writers, and I liked my work. Um, and I wrote a few books about psychology and rock and roll and did other things. And then I decided I would write a book uh, a, a novel and make my main character a perfumer. And I have no idea why I thought that, but I, it was sounded like a kind of sexy, interesting idea. And I like doing research. Um, I had done a lot of very personal research for my book on rock and roll and met all these people in the Rolling Stones. So I liked taking a deep dive into things. So I started to read books about perfume from the turn of the last century. I sort of knew it was synthetic now and when I started to read these old books, I just loved it. I thought it was completely fascinating and it really drew me in and how eccentric and sensual and just beautiful and interesting everything seemed. So I took a little class where you could, uh, it was at an aromatherapy studio here in the Bay Area and I made a solid perfume in the class and I just loved the materials. I just thought they were out of this world, I love them, and I just wanted to be around them. And so I just, um, as a person who doesn't much have a plan in life, I just kind of threw myself in to um, finding them and being involved with them. And I had a friend I took this class with, and she said, let's start a perfume line. I had a little bit of skill with it in the beginning. She said, let's start a perfume line. You know, you'll make the perfumes, I'll do the business. And, um, and we started this perfume line, this was in the 90s, and we were in Bergdorf Goodman's and Neiman Marcus, it was like another world. And um, the business fell apart pretty in pretty short order, and um, I was just totally hooked. I mean, really just, you know, jonesing to work with the materials and to learn about it. And so I went on, I decided I was kind of lousy at business, and that I should um, only do custom perfumes, never really. And I wasn't sure I liked business anyway. And I, uh, but by that time, being so obsessed with the materials and the books, um, uh, the person I had written a book for, um, a psychology book, my last psychology book, said, why don't you write a book for me on perfume? And that book became Essence and Alchemy. And then kind of slowly, uh, just added things that I'm still doing. I, I'm not really doing anything very different. Um, I was interested in um, making perfume and I did and custom perfume and writing books. The few things that I do, I started out doing, I'm still doing and still learning about. So that's, I kind of guess, a sort of shorter version of how I got here. Yeah, and I'm sure there's always a long version and a short version of everything, but so it really did come down to the materiality of it for you. For me, and the it still materials. is. Yeah. The, the materials and the creative process. I just loved uh, what happened when you put, put the essences together. It was endlessly fascinating, a lot like music, that it could just go in so many directions, and I just liked it. Yeah. I know that's a big core of what you do now is really it does come down to the practice for you. So, I mean, over the years, you know, uh, with, with your work, you've become a, an iconic figure for a certain style of practice, which is really in a lot of ways in opposition to sort of the mainstream um, small batch, you know, with a reverence for materials. And I do have to apologize. My cat is, as predicted, making her appearance. So I'm, I'm going to try to keep her here by holding her down, but she might. <laughs> but um, so... 
so why do you think these sorts of approaches are important, you know, in perfumery, this, and to reiterate, this sort of small batch uh, materials first approach that you've become uh, representative of? What, what, why, is, why does this matter for you or for perfume as a whole? Well, I, I think um, I like the work. I, I, I'm not, it's not a way station to anything else. It's really an end in itself. So I'm not looking to become anything different than what I'm doing. I, I mean, I think some people want to grow and have a big business and that's a model that's really attractive to them. It's not attractive to me. I like, um, I like the actual work um, of making things. I like the thinking that goes on. I like the expansiveness that takes place in my head. Um, I like the connecting one-on-one -on -one with my, the students that I have. I like word by word. I think I just like small things. I'm not much as a human being attracted to things that get big. Um, I just, all of it leaves me sort of uninterested. And I think most people are more attracted to things like that than somebody like me is. So I just feel very lucky that I found a way to go on working every day in a way that really speaks to me. And so I love, you know, searching for the materials. I don't mind if I can't get them anymore. I like, you know, making each batch and having to adjust it. I like all that. And I, I think I don't really know why I like it, but it feels very workmanlike and I, I like that. You think if you if you if you had a sort of larger business approach, um, and not to minimize the impact your business, you know your your practice has had because it's large in some ways, but in terms of, you you know you very much have your hands in the material. Do you think that if you if you had a larger business, sort of a more mainstream business, that would compromise your your work in some way? I mean, yes, yes, yeah. I, I feel I feel whenever I do something, I I have a kind of silent thought or prayer about. Um, how much attention it takes for me to feel like I've done a good job. And if there were more, I couldn't give it that kind of attention. And I like that. I, I like giving things the attention that I feel they deserve. It feels like my life makes sense to me. I feel like I, I'm more interested in a life that's not even in the century. I'm very drawn to things from the past. Um, and I like I like that pace of life. I like that pace of interaction. And I like going deep into things. And I feel sometimes, always, because so much goes wrong with just simply mailing a package or making something, that I have the luxury and the time to set it right, to answer a person when they email me. All those things are just important to me. So I feel like if I couldn't do that, I would feel, um, I feel very incomplete about what I was doing. And, and so being able to live and work in a way that honors the values that I have, that just feels like a complete luxury that I like. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, it's, a, it's impressive, you know, because it's, it's very hard to survive in this world, you know, as, you know and, to, and to, to maintain your smallness and maintain that integrity. And, you know, I, when I first started the Institute, I, I don't know if I invented this, Mandy, but I have it in my mind that at some point you called me and you said, hey, Saskia, don't sell out, you know? I, and and I, I, I did. you did, right? I think you said, I think you actually said, don't fuck it up, don't sell out. <laughs> and then forgive the people well, I always, who I swear, I always but. It's an old line by who, you know, meet the old boss, same as, you know, the new boss, the new boss, same as the old boss. What, what, from my perspective, and I, I suppose I've never dropped my psychological interest in the world, I feel like when people get outside of uh, whatever it is that drew them to what they were doing, I feel like they, um, they try to get it back. I mean, when I would look at like big businesses, say, that sold their business, then they'd be back trying to build it back up again. And I, I feel like it's just very important to stay with what values speak to your soul and, um, and not be greedy and not be greedy. Yeah. Try to figure out yeah. what that really is and not to be, uh, not be seduced by things that are, I don't know, not really what they seem. Yeah, don't believe your own hype, I think, is uh, how I, I try to remind myself, you know, but and that comes from what you've sort of taught me over the years. And so let's talk about the work. Um, 
uh, since you love the work. So, so when you're, when you're in, embarking upon a new perfume making adventure, you know, when you're like, okay, I want to make this, this project, how, how does that beginning start? What, what's the first thing that triggers the idea to make a new perfume or, you know, and how do you go about it? A feeling. I, I often start with a feeling that, or an, uh, an experience, something that's like personal to me that I think someone would write a story about or would um, write a song, something that's meaningful that grabs my uh, imagination. And also two essences. I always start with two essences that are usually far apart from each other in terms of how they smell. They're kind of high contrast with one another and they're the anchor points and they're connected to that feeling. They embody something about that feeling. And I, that's where I always begin from. And it's always different. And those two things are kind of um, the guiding light of how I create something that I'm gonna make. And they're, they're very strong in my mind and everything else that comes into it has to earn its place in relation to that. So oftentimes there's like a, a large, say, group of essences that I, I'm thinking could work, like I'll take them down from my organ, which is what I'm sitting in front of, and place them on the counter and think this could be good, that could be good, this could work, that could work. And then I go back to these two anchor points of the creative process for me, and then I see how they fit. And as things start to fit in, then a lot of the things will no longer fit in. So it's, it's kind of editing. It's editing my thought and my thought or my inspiration grows and, and shrinks as I'm working and getting it dialed further into my own mind. It's very alive for me. And oftentimes when I'm working on something, I'll wake up the next morning, I'll go to bed. I'll think it's good. I think I made something good. And then I wake up the next morning and I think, oh my God, this is terrible. But I oftentimes, sometimes in my sleep, get an idea of which way to move with those original two essences and that feeling. And I just keep going. Um, basically working on a very small piece of the perfume formula over and over, kind of massaging it into place and then moving on to another piece of it until it all kind of coheres. And that takes a lot, often a lot of versions and a lot of very minute moving around, which I just love. It's kind of like bringing a photograph or, um, or a memory entirely into focus. And I feel like it's kind of magic for me, but, but also very rational. It's both kind of dreamy, but also very practical and rational. I like very much creating with both ends of the extreme, the dreamy and the practical. It sounds like a very, um, a very uh, it sounds like, an, I mean, you're a very untraditional person, but it sounds in a way like a, also a traditional approach. I think we had a little camera shift. It's cool. It's, I did. I, I was like worried. A, it was. It's a cool. It's, it's like. Am I? Is, the, is my entire head in there? I was worrying about that. Yeah, you're good. You're actually like you're well framed. Okay. Plus, the, you know, this is Zoom. I think uh, we'll we'll we're all like accustomed to. <laughs> so don't worry. Um, I was going to say, in, in a way, I mean, you're very unconventional, you know, as, as a person, but in a way. Um, that what you described sounds like a very traditional, not conventional, but very traditional approach. You know, this sort of, you start in pieces and then you start to put the pieces together, which is kind of cool to hear because it, it seems like that really works. I mean, does every little section of your formula feel like a, a, a coherent thought that then gets put into a sentence in some way or I'm extrapolating a little bit, but. Well, every, everything has to carry its weight. So everything that's in the, in the perfume formula, a little like writing, has to have a reason to be there. And I need to know the reason, like this is, this is um, kind of tempering that, like this essence is, 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 is locking together with this essence and what they're doing is they're magnifying this feeling or this one is just buried under there and there's just a wisp of it in, in, to, be see, to be smelled or these two together will offset that. So I'm always kind of looking at the relationships between the essences that I've chosen and are they actually contributing something or do I just kind of like them? And if I just kind of yeah. like them or have a kind of um, 
interest in using them or passion to use them, I usually will weed those out. I feel like it has to hold together for me as an art, as an art form. And so everything in there needs to be contributing to the end result or I should take it out. And so that's not always obvious. Sometimes it's a, it's a process of, of, of stripping out certain layers to see what's going on in the structure. The structure is very important to me. And there's not a lot of, I think, information about structure in natural perfume. And I only work with naturals. And naturals are really complicated and hard to work with because they have so many facets to them. They have many warring aromas inside of the DNA of just who they are. For example, <clears throat> I had this um, uh, oil I got recently. Could I press one? Um, called, um, it was a special cypress from Madagascar. And um, I really loved it. And I was super excited because it's very hard with natural essences to have an uh, ocean airy scent. It just kind of <clears throat> isn't there that much. And so I was thrilled. And I put it in my, this blend I made called um, Forest Bathing. And it was an anchor. It was one of the big anchors for that. Hang on a minute, I have water. No problem. And when, no I, <clears throat> when I put it in, it kind of made everything awful. It just, it didn't work the way I wanted it to. And I was very pushy. You know, I had decided it was an anchor. I was putting it in. It was going to work. It was gorgeous. I got the ocean thing I wanted. I got the air. You know, I was not abandoning ship, but it was weird. And at, when I started to work with it, when it hooked up with other natural essences, it made this minty weird thing. Like I didn't have any mint, but it got minty and weird. And because it had this very green minty facet and it hooked up with a facet of that with other things I was interested in. And it took me a while to even figure out that was the problem. So that, but I like problems. I feel like every perfume of mine has lots of problems in it that I'm solving, which I find fascinating. I had sandalwood as an anchoring point. That one really didn't make it in. And that was like, oh, you know, when I'm creating, I'm gonna shoehorn this essence in here. You know, it really belongs, it fits with the story. I really want to put it in. I'm going to shove this in there. It's so beautiful. I can make it work. And in the end, the sandalwood was completely gone. I could never figure out how to solve putting the sandalwood in. But I did solve the cypress. And I feel like, oh my God, that was so terrific for me. That's kind of what's going on in my head when I'm creating. That's how I think about the materials. They're kind of like friends or enemies or something in between. Do I yeah, sound like, like voices I'm... in a chorus, right? Sometimes the voice doesn't fit the chorus somehow, even though the voice is beautiful, right? That's cool. I, I didn't, it must be kind of gutting to have to give one a material up that you like so much sometimes, you know? It's fun. Actually, for me, I like, I like that it's intellectually rigorous. I like that it's both sensual and intellectually rigorous. I enjoy it a lot. I enjoy that process. And when I teach, I try to teach that process. To people because I, I believe that's what you're in for if you work with all natural essences. I think it's just a completely different way of working when you work with all naturals and it requires a different kind of thinking and a different kind of processing of materials. Yeah, um, that's uh, okay. So, so let's get back a little bit to sort of your business. We actually have a question from somebody who's on the chat, Jess Manella. Hi, Jess. Uh, she's actually, she's, she's asking that, um, she's wondering if your work, your, your, your principles, your sort of integrity, your work integrity was something that you came to your practice with, or if it's something you sort of came to along the way through, you know, experience, something that you learned as you get along, went, went along, the sort of intention to stay small, you know, that, that, that sort of core mandiness. Um, I, I think that I, um, my principles are important to me. Um, and I'm the kind of person that um, I'd say to a certain extent is not easily swayed just because I'm not interested. I'm very deeply interested in some things and completely uninterested in a lot of things. So I think things that would be seductive to a lot of people are not seductive to me. So I think I, 
I didn't have those issues because I just kind of like what I like. You know, I could eat the same meal over and over again and certainly the same chocolate bar. Mm -hmm. So I, I, li I like what I like. Um, but I do think along the way, um, things come up and it's interesting because you define yourself in relation to what comes up and what moves you make in relation to them. So things have come up um, that have challenged my values and who I think I am and what I think I stand for and my, you know, uh, greediness or uh, rigor or creative process or whatever. I mean, things do come up in life that allow you to figure out who you are right then. And so when those things have happened, I've been aware they've been going on and I would have to rethink something that I had, quote, a position about that may not fit for me anymore. I think as life goes on um, in that way, you change as you hopefully gain wisdom and self-knowledge, but certain things aren't negotiable for me. And, and I've been able to uh, hold to those without much trouble, um, just because I'm not interested. And I say, I say no, I say no all the time. I'm a really say no to most things that come my way. I think about them, but I usually say no. Um, and I say yes to very little, like I said, yes to this, but I don't say yes yeah, to a thank lot. You, Mandy. <laughs> I don't say yes to a lot. And it's just because I really want the time for the things that really matter to me. Yeah. What are those non-negotiables for you? If you could elucidate them a little bit for, for, I mean, I'm sure it, it's, it's probably a tricky question to answer because they're so intangible in a way, but do you have any ideas of like, what are your non, like, okay, you work with naturals only. That's one. Yeah. Is I there, work, are there I others? With naturals that, only. I don't want to get any bigger than stuff I can do myself. So I don't want to grow yeah. uh, to an extent that I couldn't make everything by myself that I couldn't write a note to everybody who bought something from me, that mm -hmm. I couldn't, um, you know, the things I, I guess I'd say the things I choose to get involved with that I could feel I did a good job, that they were not beyond me. Um, I, uh, I, I don't want, um, uh, I, I like things to be little, so I like the public things I do to be on the smaller, smaller side. And um, like, I, I love looking for essences. Um, I feel very, uh, I spend a lot of time sourcing the materials that I have. And um, I like looking around for the unusual materials to work with. Um, I just feel like most of my daily practice are things that I like to do. I loved opening my little museum. I'm sad that it's closed. I, I kind of hope it'll be open again, although I can't, for example, that's something I can't figure out. I cannot figure out how in COVID-19 I could have a place where people could smell things without, you know, yeah, yeah it's super tricky. How are you? How are you trying to? How are you thinking about that with for the museum? I mean, let's talk about the museum for a minute, actually, because actually Aubrey asked. That's a good segue. But um, how do you approach uh, the project? Aubrey asked, how do you approach the project of curating an experience for your visitors with scent? Oh, um, that was the most fun of anything I ever did. <laughs> it was just the best. Um, I had collected stuff for 30 years, all kinds of things. When they would come my way, I would buy them and kind of nobody wanted them anyways. And I had all this stuff in my studio and, and previously in my kitchen before I had a studio and I would get it all out and, you know, show it to people. I'd have, you know, postcards and books and old bottles of oil and all kinds of stuff. And, um, people kind of looked like they liked it, but you know, you never know if people are just being polite. And, um, mm. but I had a lot of stuff and people would come over and I would get it all out and show it to them and, you know, go on. And then when they'd leave, I'd have this complete mess on my hands to put everything back into wherever yeah. it would come from. So I that I, when we finally thought we'll make this museum, which I think was kind of a crazy idea on my part that worked, um, I didn't have to put anything away anymore, which seems like just great. I'm kind of lazy <laughs> by nature. 
and it was always out and Foster and I and Devin would always say, oh my God, we don't have to put this away. So I had this stuff that had completely captivated me and, and stuff I didn't have. And I put it out there and I wanted people to have the experience I had when I fell in love with these essences. And so I set yeah. it up in a way that I would have set it up for me. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, when I made the museum, I kind of made it for myself. If I was visiting, this is what I would have liked. So I had little, um, I got the, all the animal ingredients and I had lots of old etchings of them and old bottles and old essences. I put them out and I had these very low tech smell me bottles that I had used in some exhibits I had done. I had some exhibits in some art galleries and um, all it was was a, um, a kind of apothecary bottle with a, um, a piece of black felt on the bottom of the bottle and some of the essence there. So when you lifted the top off the bottle, it said, smell me, and you could smell those aromas. And I knew I wanted to have a perfume organ like the one in back of me, but ones where people could really smell the materials and kind of go on a journey in their head. So I, I got that made, I got everything made out there for, and I wanted it to be beautiful. I wanted people to just be wowed uh, by how pretty things were. And by that time, I had collected a hundred turn of the century books. So I put them, we, Devin, um, Devin is my son. He put them together so that people could touch them because I wanted everything to be authentic and nothing to be a reproduction. So we put all the old books out there and they're wild. They're so interesting and um, let people touch them and read them. And we kind of grew, grew. Oh, and we had a, we have a, a, a two big cupboards of botanical materials that people can touch and see, so they can see vetiver and they can see oak moss and they can touch it, and um, angelica root and agarwood and all these things. So they would make a personal connection to the plant where the material had come from. And we just had thousands of visitors and. The best part really was at least half the visitors um, were repeats. Like people would come and then they'd come back another time with someone else in their family or someone they loved. And it was kind of like a community. And I just loved it. And I'm sad that it's closed now. Yeah, it's I'm um, hoping it'll come open. back. Yeah, I've, I, I mean, just, you know, we have a personal relationship and I, I just, to attest, in fact, I have a stepdaughter, everybody, called Robin, and Robin is this bored with perfume. She really doesn't care. But the only time she really engaged was when I took her to the Aftel archive, and she really got excited. And I think it is about that tangibility and that being able to, like, experience the materials, pick them up. And, and some of them are really weird, you know, for outsiders. Like, why is there, you know, Castorium, like, you know, all this stuff is bizarre sometimes, you know? So, it's it's um, totally bizarre, but you can't be there and not be gobsmacked by how interesting life is. It's just mm -hmm. so interesting. And that these plants that give off these amazing odors are alive forever in those odors. I mean, nature has this life cycle where things live and then they die, but the essences are really alive forever. And they have been yeah. in people's lives, you know, across the globe and across time. And I think people connect to that. And I think it makes them feel good, even if they have no interest whatsoever in perfume. I feel like with scent, people are always being marketed to, to buy something or to go to the department store. And so I wanted something that would just be about pleasure and being connected to nature, which is kind of what it's about for me. Yeah, yeah, I, it's, I'm getting a little, because I, I took my stepfather to visit the museum when he was quite far along with Alzheimer's as well, and he's since passed, but I remember that 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 the options, all the different options were like, we were, you and I were trying to find something he could smell, so you're, I'm sure you remember. Um, I do. Yeah, it's a pretty magical place. Yeah, uh, it was, Ralphie. It was, it was wonderful. I mean, that's part of what's gone on for me. I'm very shy, really, by nature. And I go out and see every single visitor because I'm so interested in where it takes them. You know, I, I like that connection with people, particularly in these times that are so difficult. I feel like it was uh, really 
a, a beautiful aspect of being human that, I mean, that somehow I got to put together somehow and be there. I mean, I have no idea. I mean, on some level, I have no idea how I was so lucky. Yeah, well, I mean, lucky and smart, you know. <laughs> um, getting back to your creative process a little bit, uh, Matt, um, there's quite a few questions that are sort of about book recommendations and how to store essential oils, but I'll, I'll, I'll say those for the end, guys, the things that are pretty, like, sort of in, in the weeds about it. But uh, Matt uh, asked a question. Oh, sorry, Nicole, uh, under Matt's, uh, under her husband, Matt wants to know about how you deal with creative blocks in your creative process. What happens? Um, what happens when you hit a creative roadblock? Uh, what do you do? You know, how do you handle it? Um, it's a good question. It's a really good question. Um, I'm always very scared before I start anyway. So I always feel like I'm kind of pole vaulting over something like a creative block because I find the getting into something, it's kind of scary. I, I always have, whether it's writing, which is really scary, or, or making something new, I have the same, um, you know, stuff in my head that everybody else has. Um, so I, I have, I've made enough stuff that I recognize that that takes place when you're on the side, but once you're in, it's different, even if you only have your toe in. So I usually will start, and it's pretty foolproof for me, between that picking of the two essences and a feeling. Like I'll start there which doesn't mean it will work, but it'll get me going. And so I guess what I believe about the creative process and being blocked is you have to move from outside of it. Even if you move to something that doesn't work, you've moved and then you can move from there. So I feel like you have to become inside the process and not be outside, whatever way you can do that. I like the metaphor of sticking your toe in the pool because that's kind of what it is. You're sticking your toe and you can't jump in, but once you're in the pool, you just have to do it, right? So, yes. um, so actually, uh, since, since it's actually an interesting segue because um, you talked about writing and also one of, the, one of our participants, Don, Donina, has a question about, um, about scent and narrative. So, and I'm actually just gonna read you their question because it's a good one uh, and you are a writer. Um, do you have any favorite or significant story that, that you understand in the form of scent or any scent that's told you a story, perhaps? Um, I may, maybe take a moment. <laughs> I'd, I'd have a hard time answering that. So, I, I, my, my last psychology book was called The Story of Your Life, which was where I decided I'd be a novelist, which I wasn't. Um, but for that, what I realized, because um, I was very, very interested in narrative, um, I realized when I was a psychotherapist that people told me stories. That's really how they communicated their life to me. Every session they come in, they describe something that happened and it would be a story. And I would enter that story and try to understand it from their perspective and understand other things as well. And so I read a lot of books about how narratives were constructed both orally in therapy and on the page in fiction. And that was very, that was my last thing I really took a deep dive into before I got myself into perfume. So yeah, I made a perfume. Um, I, you know, a lot of them have something like that in it. I made a perfume over um, grieving about someone and the perfume is called Memento Mori. And I had for a long time thought it was a, just a heartbreaking loss in my life, huge unbearable grief. And um, I thought, you know, I should really, make a perfume about this feeling because as people write about things, I knew from being a therapist for artists and writers, which was what I was, that the creative process can be very healing. And so I thought I would apply that to my own practice in perfume and make a perfume kind of about grief and um, a particular grief for me, but grief in general. And um, it was a very kind of strange, process being in it it sort of followed the relationship i mean all these odd things happened narratively while i was working on it like it would be there and it would not be there it would be good and then it would be awful it was kind of a lot like the relationship but it was the making of it and um and i picked weird stuff to put in it too it was just but i found as i kept working on it it was kind of helping me 
or, or doing something inside for me. And I was hoping it might. And I finally got it all made um, and, and felt good about it. And it was weird. And, and if someone would ever call me up, I would always, you know, try to talk, you know, suggest they didn't buy that one. You know, if they were interested, <laughs> I thought like, oh my God, this one's so weird. Don't buy this one. You'll be miserable or whatever. But what happened, and I, when I put it out, I got this really awful review um, on a very, very big blog, which hurt my feelings. And um, it just said it was dreadful. And I thought like, Okay, it kind of reminded me of this story. Uh, one of my friends is a, was a rock and roll, uh, a guitar technician and photographer, and he worked with Prince. He worked with all these interesting people. He told me this story about Prince. Um, I don't know how I've gotten onto this, but I have. And Prince oh, got I, a I car. Where you're going. Prince got <laughs> a car, and um, he drove it with my friend in the car out from the uh, car dealership, and he. Uh, he drove it like he drove it some uh, in a parking lot. He went up to like a pole or whatever. He scratched it, and um, he said, "Okay, that's done. You know, like I've now oh. you know, get a new car. Like you're gonna do this. Don't thing. have to worry about it anymore. Don't have to worry about <laughs> yeah. it. It's done. It's totally done." So I thought, okay. That is very wise. <laughs> so I thought, okay, you know, I got this perfume about how, I got this review about how putrid it is and terrible. And like, I don't have to worry about it anymore because guess what? It's already happened. Yeah. So that, <laughs> what happened with it, which was so interesting to me, was it found its way to people. It's extremely popular of my perfumes. And a lot of times when people buy it, I often wonder, are they grieving? And oddly enough, people write me and tell me it makes them sad. And that they feel like hmm. sad, but they feel, and I feel like it was like a little message in a bottle. Mm -hmm. There, they say it reminds them of but their grandmother who died. But people have written me about that perfume. And it's not wow. like traditionally narrative, but it was just beautiful for me. And just was a sign that I, I'm doing things that matter for me. That's, that's, I think I bought that perfume actually. So I think, I think I know, I know what the one you're talking about. That's very cool. I mean, it's very cool to have that sort of connection too with people where you make something that, I mean, you say message in a bottle. You have heard you say that before. And it's such an apt metaphor, isn't it? For, for what, for, for perfumery, for your practice specifically, because you are communicating, you know, yes. and sometimes they get the message. Sometimes they don't, you know. Sometimes when people get the message, I just feel like, you know, this larger sense that you have sometimes with the creative process or what I feel perfume or any creative practice is really about is being in touch with that kind of force or, you know, you read something that's spectacular and it shifts the furniture around in your head. So I, I think going back to the staying small, like, I feel like I, I'm having the kinds of experiences that are meaningful to me and the others the, the bigger things just aren't yeah yeah i i can see i can see that um okay there's a couple of places we can go I, i'm actually curious because because you recently published uh, an article in uh Fragrantica. About about your 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 research into Ifra, and I was you know you and I had talked about that quite a bit uh, as it was developing, and I, I was following it, and I was happy to see it come out. Um, do you want to just share your thoughts about this with with the people on this call? Because I'm not sure if everyone's had a chance to look to read it, but definitely look it up after this uh, on Fragrantica. Yeah, it's gotten 86 responses, which is kind of amazing to me. I go back and see yeah. if it's caused like a shit storm. I don't know if I'm allowed to use that word, but anyways. Or, Has it? No, actually people really feel a lot like me. Most of them, there's one person there who doesn't. But in general, people have been kind of great. Um, IFRA is the governing body um, of kind of legislation for perfume and in for synthetics and naturals. And it's um, run by the kind of big four perfume houses. And they have um, kind of systematically um, made it extremely difficult to use all naturals in perfume. And um, so I wanted to write something that was uh, critical of that uh, situation. And so I did, and I put it on Fragrantica. 
And um, I feel like um, uh, that, that making it so impossible to use these heritage materials really puts everyone uh, kind of at a disadvantage and makes it uh, difficult for people to have the connection kind of spiritually and psychologically and aesthetically with natural materials that people have had throughout the ages and across the globe. And so I addressed a few of the issues, which are allergens, um, which could be warned against. And I also cited the situation with artisanal cheese making, which also suffered the same fate, although they got that turned around. And so I just wanted to criticize that and hopefully maybe attract some attention for people being more critical of the IFRA guidelines and the guidelines for quote, safe perfume, because I think uh, it's not exactly what it looks like. That was, that was very succinctly put. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting uh, question. I mean, it also to me relates a little bit to how you view yourself uh, with regards to the industry, you know, and you've been practicing for, for a while. And so you certainly have relation or have, you know, have, have no people, uh, you know, within the mainstream industry. And yet you really do operate somewhat as an outsider. I mean, it actually ties in a little bit with a question from Tia. I mean, how, do, how does that, how do you, how does one live with that? You know, is that challenging is it a position of power for you um yeah well, i started 30 years ago you know in my yeah. first book I got an award from the fragrance foundation i was a fifi finalist you know i've i've kind of you know i've been around forever it feels like i'm you know yeah. i've been in this situation for a long time um in the beginning, you know it took me a while to learn kind of what the subtext was in the larger perfume world kind of what was going on. Um, I got offered lots of, uh, to work for some big houses. I got offered to be bought out. I've had a lot of offers for lots of things, um, which are interesting because it's allowed me to think through who I am and what I want. Um, I don't have any interest in the big perfume world. I, I know some of those people. Um, I have nice enough relationships with them, but I'm an outsider. Um, and I'm gladly an outsider. I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a big joiner anyways, but I like kind of just steering my own boat. I, I don't really want to be in the larger uh, corporate perfume community. I just, I just, it's not interesting to me. Yeah, it gets back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the conversation, the sort of intentional smallness and being master of all aspects of your practice and, and all that, right? Yeah. That, that, and also, I just, I feel, according to my own values, there's nothing better than doing something you believe in and being able to act out your deepest values. It's, I'm not at all certain that happens in a corporate environment at all or in a larger context. I think, you know, I'm an old hippie. I just, I just, you know, an old bohemian. I, I like living in that way. and. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I just feel very lucky that I've somehow squeaked through. Yeah. Well, we're fortunate for it. Um, so we're, we're sort of coming towards, uh, you know, we have about 15 minutes. So I want to make sure to give this opportunity, give some opportunity to folks to ask some questions. But before we open it up to, to questions, and by open it up, I'll read your questions. It's not all talk at once because it'll be chaos. There's actually a couple. Um, I just want to make sure you have an opportunity to, to share uh, things that are that you're excited about that are coming up that you're working on. You know, is there anything that you're you're stoked on? You know, yeah. Um, for instance, I'm I know some very yeah. excited. I have lots of little projects. Uh, first of all, I'm teaching my students this Saturday um, in my first Zoom class, I, so I'm very excited. One of the things I needed to change from COVID nineteen. I, I, taught, I teach about four times a year in my studio, a little tiny class, everything's tiny, um, of eight people. And I'm teaching um, on Saturday um, on Zoom. And so I'm super excited about that. I had to really rethink how to do the class to achieve the learning goals that I wanted to. So I'm super excited about that. And then um, I'm gonna start to do some videos of the museum with Devin. Um, it's kind of tours and, and um, 
virtual exhibits because I feel like I don't know when I can open that again. So that's very exciting. And then I have this crazy new product, which I'll show you. It's really nutty, um, but I'm very excited about it. Um, in medieval times, they had pomanders, which I like totally loved. I tried to buy one for the museum, which was truly crazy. It was so expensive. But I did a, a job for Google. And when I did this job for Google, I had these little, I hope people can see them. I had these little felt yeah. balls. Can you ever see these guys? They're so cute. Yeah. And for them, I had scent. I put them on the balls and I kind of like them. I'm a weaver. I, I do weaving. So I like textiles. I had these. So I made this blend, which I'm getting ready to put in this little box. The three little balls and I have two little blends. One is um, called Respite, which is kind of, just nice and warm and fuzzy. And the other is this very old blend that they had in medieval times called the Thieves Blend, which supposedly um, kept these thieves that were gra grave robbers and, and, and uh, worse um, from getting the plague. And I, what's odd is I had thought of doing this six months ago before COVID-19. I tried to get it, it up in time for Christmas, but I couldn't get it done. So now it's very fitting. Here it is. Here's this cute. And here, this is super cute. Um, I have a little bag and you can put your little ball. I don't know if this is ridiculous. In the little bag and fragrance it and just carry it around with you. In your pocket. In your pocket. Nice. So it's called a pocket, Some... pocket pomander. So yeah, I'm very excited about it. And I'll probably Some make deep cuts. What? Deep historical cuts there. It's like nice deep references to history, isn't it? The history, it's just fun. And I just, yeah. feel, I'm excited to kind of put it out in the world and see what happens with it. That's cool. Um, okay, so uh, Brenda wants your pominder. So. Um, so a couple quick questions, just some quick logistical ones. I assume your Zoom class is sold out? Well, no, my class is so tiny. <laughs> I think that must so, be the okay. word I've said. The class is the class is filled. Yeah, I've done. I've been teaching for thirty years in my studio, and I teach eight students at a time. And to take that class, you have to have my workbook. And so, if you have my, it never goes to the public. So, if you have my workbook, then you go on my email list, and then you can sign up to take the class. And then there's only eight people. So there's eight people in this class because I had a class for March and for June. And I had to cancel it. So it's the people who were signed yeah. up for that class. Yeah. They're in this new Zoom class, which I'm hoping is going to be good on Saturday. You know, I, I found Zoom to be surprisingly uh, connected. So I hope you feel the same way. Um, so yeah, guys, life goals, uh, get her workbook and then, and then you'll get the email list. So then you can take the next one. Um, a couple of questions that I found kind of interesting, actually, Jill is asking uh, when working with natural materials, and I found this when I used to do oil painting when I was an art student, if you add too many, it can become sort of a cacophony or an oil painting is sort of muddy brown. Uh, is there a limit? Uh, I mean, do you, are there any rules to this that could help her sort of not make a bloody mess? Yes, let me say one thing I saw there. Someone asked where they can get the workbook. If you go to my website oh, yeah. and look up, my website's aftelier.com and you look up workbooks, that's where it is. Yes, I think yeah. a problem with naturals is put, putting too many materials in and not understanding the facets and the blending capacities. I think it's very structured working with naturals. So if you put in too many naturals, you'll probably have an unholy mess on your hands. So you have to know how to proceed and how to edit so that you can make something good. And every time you add something new, it needs to be called for by everything else that's in there. So when you're making those kinds of choices, what one of the things I say in class, and I believe is you're kind of like when you start with your two essences, let's say, you're in this huge house. You know, you have all these possibilities. You can go in all these rooms. You can put anything in. When you add the third one, maybe the possibilities are still open. But when you get up to the fourth, the doors close and the rooms get smaller. So at the very end of adding things into a blend and considering them, it should be very small, the pool that you can still use of materials that will contribute to what you have. And so it's that kind of rigorous editing focus you need to make something that's not like mud. 
Thank you. It gets back to what you were talking about earlier about taking things even though you love them because they just don't work. I want to share a nice thought that the Virginia Riley shared. She, she, um, she wrote, uh, that there is a beautiful novel called Like Water for Chocolate by Laura Esquivel that explores the influence of emotion in cooking. There are some gorgeous passages in the book that tie, that tie the tears the main character leaves in her cooking while crying and how sad her family feels when they eat the meal. Your story about Memento Mori reminds Virginia of this novel. So that's very nice, Virginia. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing. Thank you. That's yeah, it's lovely. It's very sweet. Yeah, Virginia is actually running a, a, a writing group right now. So, um, okay, I want to make sure we didn't miss any important, important questions. There's some technical questions about storing, um, you know, uh, aromatic uh, nat naturals. And then uh, somebody's curious, well, yeah, um, that, but I think um, just keep them in a cool place, right? Somebody's curious about your relationship to synthetics. Uh, and I, one of the things that I was really surprised when I first met you was that you were like, look, I don't hate synthetics. I just choose not to work with them, you know? So have you ever tried them? Have you ever worked with them? Why not? Um, or why? Um, and this is where Coco gets annoying. I'm sorry. Um, I have no problem with people working with synthetics. And a lot of my students work with mixed media. They work with both. And that's like totally fine by me. I just like naturals i like how complex they are i like how they're very beautiful to me i love their histories i love learning about them they just speak to me they're my uh they're like jewels and so i i kind of love that but i can totally understand that other materials call to other people when i've smelled synthetics i feel they smell kind of texture and shape they smell different to me, and I just am very, and always was, just attracted to that complexity. But the, I like good naturals. In other words, there are, there's a long uh, kind of range of quality inside of all natural materials. There are good versions of jasmine and bad, good versions of blood orange and bad. And that it, they're dominated by certain facets and the way those facets come together. And so I'm very interested in that. A lot like cooking, you know, for me, if you start with something that's really gorgeous, you just have a head start. It's kind of like if you have a perfectly ripe tomato, um, it's just you have a head start over one that's not perfectly ripe and, and, and delicious. So I like to start with materials that I feel are extremely beautiful. That's, that's great, thank you. Uh, there was a question I missed a little bit earlier about, from Shar, who is, uh, and, and I know, I think this is interesting for you because I know you have a very love-hate relationship to marketing, but she's, she was curious about sort of how you uh, engage with, with, uh, with, with marketing, Atelier, as a brand, when you're engaged in so many different things like writing, you know, perfumery and the museum. Do you separate these things or do you see this as a sort of holistic grouping? Um, That's interesting. Um, I feel like everything I do kind of springs from the same core of, uh, I, I feel like I, I'm not really doing anything that much different. I have a, a line of chef's essences. I work in food. I work in flavor too. And I feel like um, I, I I have complicated um, relationship to marketing itself because, for example, we never have a sale. Nothing is ever discounted. We kind of have a very strange business model. I don't think we follow a normal business model. I feel the internet has made it so possible for me to, um, being shy, to put things in the world that I believe in and connect with people over things I believe in without kind of having to market. And so I find marketing in any conventional self sense kind of not all, not all that interesting. Um, but I feel like if marketing means you put out what you believe in and you love and you stand behind that, I feel like I'm all for that. So I, again, I feel like I'm in another century to some extent. I just feel like I've been very lucky to share things that I believe in and I found people who seem to appreciate it. And that seems to me the most important thing is 
person by person, customer by customer, student by student, one at a time, I've been able to have a real connection about things that I believe in that touch a chord in them. And that's, if that's marketing, I guess that's, I do that, but that's what I think about what I do. It's such a tricky term, isn't it? Um, yeah. Okay, guys. Well, we've taken an hour of Mandy's time and um, she has some stuff to do. So there's some questions about sort of how to sign up and, and, and so on. Is there, a, is there a nice email that people can, can uh, you know, get these questions answered um, for, for you, Mandy? Yes. Like a general. Uh, how, you can do hello at aftelier.com and that's A like okay. Adam, F like Frank, T like Tom, E-L-I-E-R.com. Right. And you can um, just e email me and foster my husband who I work with or I will email you back if we know the answers and if we don't, we'll tell you we don't. But yeah, absolutely feel free. Yeah, so any questions about how to sign up, I think, um, you know, email her, uh, email them, and I'm sure they can answer those quickly. Um, yeah, you, Char, also, you're welcome. you can go to the, if you lose all of that, you can just go to the website. There's a contact form, and also I'm on. Well, the classes page. There's a classes page. There, oh, there's a page about the, including the new Zoom class. You can find all that, okay. there, read about all that if you want to, or ask us questions. Just feel free, and we're on all those social media things. Too. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, um, Jasmine. What introduction uh, are you are you referring to? Jasmine's asking for a copy of the introduction for this class. Could, Mandy could read it out for us, like the one that ended with psyche, like at the beginning. Your words. Oh, oh. you know that wasn't Mandy. I, that was somebody else reading from a book. Book. Uh, so maybe well, you have to find that piece oh, of in you, her book. If you want me to read it again, won't you be yeah. bored? I mean, but, <laughs> I can get the book. The book. Well, Ken, why don't you let everybody know where you found that that passage? Maybe save save Mandy from going into her books. And Kellen, are you still there? I know she said she got it from Top Notes. I know where she's talking okay. about. Okay. Thank you so much. What page? Yeah, guys, make sure to check out Mandy's books because she's got quite a few. They're all available from her uh, on her website, of course. And, and uh, definitely, Mandy I has found... introduced so many people to this world. Wow. It's here. Did you, did you really like want me to? No, no, just go oh, here it is. Okay, good. All right, that's good. It's on page 118 of Essence and Alchemy, which you also could get on your Kindle. It's brand new yeah. on a Kindle. <laughs> And Essence and Alchemy is one of these seminal books in perfumery, in, in contemporary perfumery. So please definitely pick that up and give it a read. It's worth it. Um, and everybody, uh, Sybil says, see you Saturday, Mandy. And thanks, oh, guys, for joining Sybil. us. Hi, Sybil. <laughs> Goody. Yeah. Lucky, lucky Sybil. Okay, uh, okay, uh, Bye, Bye <laughs> I think we're saying goodbye. And, and my cat Coco says goodbye to everybody as well. Thanks, Thank everybody, you for so your much. time. Any follow-up questions, please feel free to email, um, and we can forward the appropriate ones to, to Mandy. Um, Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening to all this. Thank you so much for all this kind interest in me. Um, I hope I made sense. <laughs> <laughs>